we all all young people have this restless spirit, but I dreamt of going to faraway places. You know, I was growing up, I, I spent my time in libraries reading books, and I was like always reading like uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, and uh, and reading about adventures and uh, Treasure Island and faraway places. And when I was uh, kind of getting a little older, I always regretted that I had been born too late and I couldn't like you know, like ride the rail or like be a pirate or something like that. I just thought I'd gotten ripped off. Uh, when I left school in, um, I don't even know what year it was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a college dropout uh, because I just couldn't, I couldn't contain myself anymore and uh, very soon found myself uh, on some distant shores and those shores were, um, were in West Africa. And uh, you know, sometimes life uh, just takes you in some places that, that uh, you don't know how you got there sometimes, or, or why life led you there, but you're just sort of following the thing, you know? I guess about 20 years ago or so, um, I made my first trip to, uh, to Ghana, West Africa. At this time, I had been studying West African drumming, uh, this, uh, this instrument that I have in front of me here, the djembe, right? We all know the djembe. What this drum was, who plays it traditionally, where it comes from, these are all questions that were just unanswered for me. Uh, and I just, I just wanted to know. It was clearly I didn't want to play it like, like disrespectfully or something like that. So over the time of studying with these guys from Mali and Guinea, I got to know the djembe a lot more, and um, uh, eventually started uh, my own program uh, in New Hampshire, where I lived, where I was uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, community ed courses and and, uh, and just uh, public classes. And over the course of a couple of years, I uh, ended up growing this program that had. Um, 100 people moving through it every single week, uh, and I was drumming uh, five nights a week, sometimes two classes a night, and it was like my life. And uh, and then a very interesting thing happened. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know life just pulls you in the direction that it wants uh, you to go, and um, and sometimes it's as as uh, as direct as a phone call. And uh, one night at about three o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, and. Um, there was this echo on the line. This was about, you know, 25 years ago, and it's this thick accent uh, of this man uh, from Ghana. Uh, his name was Ni Tete Tete, and uh, I didn't know his name or who this man was. I'd never heard of him, uh, but he had heard of me and the program that I had had formed because it was like becoming kind of a, a popular thing in uh, in New England, and uh, I was having a lot of students come through the program, and. Um, he said in this very, very thick Ghanaian accent, he said, Dave, you come to Africa with me. And he said, I said, what are you talking about? I don't even know you from anywhere. And he said, I'm building a cultural center, and I want you to come. I want you to, to help me do this. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're like, you know, 21 or 22, you can get on board with some pretty crazy things without too much hesitation. I mean, if, if I got that call right now, I'd, you know, of course, I'd probably just like hang up and get on with my life or something. But um, about six months later, I was on a plane to uh, to Ghana, West Africa, um, and met this man, uh, Ni Tete Tete, who became you know one of the the great mentors of my life. And I think I've been fortunate to have a lot of really great mentors uh, in my life uh, who've who've guided me along the the path of being a musician and an artist and just a human being. But Ni Tete Tete was one of them, and. Uh, he was indeed building a cultural center, and uh, he did need some help. And he had this really fabulous idea that because the young people in, um, in Ghana, in his home village of, of Nungwa, which is not too far from Accra, the capital city um, of, of Ghana, he was about like a couple hours away from, from Accra, um, you know, he noticed that the young people wanted, all wanted to be like uh, Europeans and Americans. They were losing interest in their own culture. And this is a culture that has been passed along uh, orally for, for centuries and centuries and centuries. And really, when something is passed down that way, a tradition, it really only takes a gap of a generation for something to disappear. And that's kind of a scary thought. But he, saw, he thought that if he built this cultural center and he invited Europeans and Americans to come there and study in Ghana, um, that the young people would see that here are these people coming from afar and uh, from, from Europe and America and studying their culture and maybe it would rejuvenate their own interest in their culture. And, um, and it was a great idea and I was totally on board. He needed help doing it and he needed, get it, he needed students there, he needed to spread the word and he also needed um, 
uh, some help building the actual structures. And so, uh, so here is uh, back in 2001, September of 2001, um, the cultural center that we were just building along the coast of this uh, place called Nungwa, um, on the coast of uh, Ghana, what was formerly known as the, as the Gold Coast, that as I came to discover, had an amazingly rich history and was one of the, the sort of the epicenters of, uh, of European exploration in the uh, 15 and 1600s. Of course, gold was, was, uh, seemed unlimited in West Africa at the time. It was just renowned for its resources. And of course, its destiny would change. After a couple of months of, of living there in Ghana, I became very aware that, uh, you know, it, it wasn't in Kansas anymore. This was, uh, it was, it was kind of a shock to my system in some ways to be, um, uh, to be in this place where uh, everything was, was so different. It was kind of like the new world that I had always dreamt of, of uh, exploring and discovering. Not that I discovered it, but it was a discovery for me. Uh, this, this whole culture that represented this whole other way of living. And um, one of the things that was, uh, that was very uh, striking to me was that at the time, um, uh, and it may still be that way, is that uh, uh, the oldest religion in the world, the Vodun, was, was still uh, very well in practice there. And um, it led to some very, very interesting discussions uh, about, uh, about cultural beliefs and superstitions and just the world as we know it. And it started this process of, of throwing my own perception of reality into, uh, into question. All right, yeah, I'm going to switch it up here and, and play some, uh, some music and then uh, I'd like to switch it up so you don't get too This is a country that was that was you know barely you know 40 or 45 years old at the time, and um, for the first like 20 or so years of their independence, um, people weren't uh, allowed uh, into the country. It was very secretive. Uh, they allowed their their ambassadors to the world were the musicians. They put together this phenomenal two different uh, troops of um, performers where they scoured the country for the best musicians and dancers they could find from all the different ethnic groups across. The country, and they recruited them into these what they were called the ballet. The first president, Sekou Touré, really wanted to to show the world who they were culturally, and so it was a very very successful group. And Famadou was one of the first uh, people to be recruited for it. He was the the lead djembe player for 30 years with Le Ballet Africain, and um, and traveled the world uh, in that position. But I was sitting on um, the banks of the Niger River one afternoon. Uh, with some, some of my new friends, and we're kind of like, uh, you know, just trying to break these cultural barriers and the language barriers and get to know each other. As I'm just talking with these, these friends, I hear this sound from, uh, from somewhere upstream uh, uh, from us, and uh, I couldn't quite place where it was coming from, but it was the sound of this instrument that I hadn't heard before, and it, it, was, um, it was this kind of flute here that I'm playing for you tonight, this flute that's called Tambe Fule, in, um, in Malinke, about my, my new friends that I was sitting with, I asked them, well, you know, what's this thing that I'm, that I'm hearing? What is this instrument? I've ne I hadn't heard a woodwind. Clearly, it was some sort of woodwind. I couldn't see who the player was in this melody. And so they said to me, said to me it's, the, it's the tambi fule. Um, and it's this uh, wooden flute that we make out of the, the, the time that they're old enough to walk. They're trained to, uh, to learn the songs and to learn the instruments, to play the kora and the, the jelly and goni, which is the, the, the griot's instruments. Um, and be able to recite their entire history through song. So it's kind of like, can you imagine, you know, if we didn't have, uh, have history books uh, and textbooks to study, but instead we just knew our entire history through, through songs that you just knew all the words by heart. And so that kind of took on a really uh, interesting um, 
thing for me because I realized, well, it's like I'm learning the, the notes and I'm learning how to play these things, but clearly if I want to understand these people and I want to understand who they are and where they're from, what they're about, I need to understand the words. So that was when I got really serious about my language studies um, so that I could kind of really advance in my in my my understanding of this. And at this point, I was going back every year to, uh, to stay with Famadou, and usually it was about three or four months at a time, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, and it was really becoming like a second home to me. Um, and the interesting thing that I found was that I was, I was living between worlds um, because while I didn't fully understand uh, Malinke culture, the more time went on, the less I understood my own culture. I would come home and uh, it didn't quite make as much sense to me as, as it had. And of course, you know, I grew up here. Um, you know, this is my culture, this is my home. But the, the contrast in thinking about our place in the world and, our, our, um, and our, how our societies function and how we interact with, uh, not only with our community, but with the larger community of the, of the natural world was, was so different in West Africa that, that it was hard for me to come home. But when, when you live in these two different worlds, uh, you just see that like, if you have a, a worldview that tells you, for example, that, uh, that those trees are, are sacred, and this was actually uh, 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 true for the people there. They had uh, sacred groves of forests where, um, where their ancestors were said to reside. And so these were places that, you know, uh, this forest could, could never be cut down uh, and it was it was a place that, that people went to 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 be in, in communion with those who had come before with their ancestral heritage and their and their spirits, who they saw as always being present and always watching over them. The ancestors were always present um, and could be found in these in these sacred groves um, and in certain trees that were said to house the spirits of the ancestors. So so certainly if you know. Believe it or not, whether it's your belief system or not, whether ancestor spirits live in trees is not the point. The point is that when you have that story, when that is your backdrop, you will, you will treat that natural environment much differently than if your story is that, is that trees can be measured in board feet of lumber. And so so Lancini's job in the village was to, to be the flute player for these soli uh, initiations and to, um, to see the, the other young people make this transition into, uh, into adulthood. And so I became Lansini's, um, Lansini's uh, flute apprentice in Konakri, and um, my focus started to shift from, from the drums to, uh, to, uh, to the flute, because there was such a richness of what uh, Lansini had to share with me, and this is the songs that I really wanted to understand, because in these songs was, was uh, the rich history of the culture. And so over the course of, of many years, uh, working with Lansini, I would live uh, part of the time with Fam Famadou and his family, and part of the time with Lansini and his family, and uh, study with both of them. Um, and uh, over the course of those, those years, uh, Lansini passed down the majority of his, uh, of his musical repertoire uh, to me, because he didn't have uh, another, another student in the village or anywhere. He had nobody to pass this on to. So it was really a kind of a unique and unusual situation for me to be in, to be sort of the recipient of this, um, this age-old uh, tradition and heritage and being told uh, by this master musician that, that it was, um, I, I was partially responsible for, for keeping it alive now. I was now a keeper of this tradition. So over the course of the years um, of studying with Famadou and Lansini, um, I would participate in these Dembedon festivals at, as a drummer, and it was uh, kind of a great honor for me to, um, to, to have been recognized as somebody that could um, that, that could, could be one of the drummers uh, for these. And I, I'll never forget my, my, first, um, my, my first real Dembedon festival at, as a drummer. I was playing both djembe and one of the dunun drums. And um, the, the way it works is sort of like, you know, it's just this big party. Uh, everybody comes in their finest and, uh, to, to dance and to celebrate. And, um, and uh, the drummers make their, their living by um, putting out a big uh, basket in front of them where people throw money into the basket for, for the musicians or sometimes just stick it to their, their sweaty foreheads or into the straps of their djembes or whatever. And they've got you know bills sticking out everywhere. And uh, it's a good Dembedon festival if everybody goes home with some money in their pocket. And of course, um, the, money, the currency they have there are guinea francs. And um, they had uh, 1,000 and 5,000 guinea franc bills. And um, uh, currently it's about 
Uh, 8,000 guinea francs is about is the equivalent of a dollar. But you know, uh, you could buy you could buy a meal in Conakry for for 500 guinea francs. So so you know, it was not a it was not a great living at the, at the time. Uh, Lansley and I calculated. We did some rough math and um, estimated that he and, and his family. I mean, he was the breadwinner for the family in Conakry at this point had grown to about. Um, 16 or 17 people living in his family compound in Conakry. He was the main breadwinner, and he was supporting them on the equivalent of about $400 a year. It was like it was like the working guys' food company is what we kind of thought. And so uh, Lansley was uh, making his flutes, and I was bringing them home, and I would sell his flutes at the time for for 100 or 125 dollars, and send all that money back to Lansley. So he went from making $400 a year to you know, $400 a month. Uh, around this time too, I had this idea that I wanted to, you know, I had I'd spent, at this point, the equivalent of like two years in West Africa uh, living in these villages, and I had this idea to, um, to write a book about my experiences and write a book about the music because there wasn't really any resources that I knew of um, about this music and about this culture that was accessible to, to people. So um, I may have mentioned that I'm an artist too. That was actually, you know, what I studied in school. Um, um, I always thought I would be an illustrator, so I said, you know, I'm going to illustrate my own book, and I had this idea for this book that was called Joliba Crossing, and Joliba is the name uh, for the Niger River in Malinke. They call it the Joliba, and I will never forget that first time that I crossed the Joliba River that night with the uh, the moon overhead and the drums from the other side. So, so the name of my book was going to be called Joliba Crossing, and um, I did a series of drawings and illustrations uh, while I was there, and. Um, this was the first edition of the book, uh, the outside cover, and I did all of these drawings, uh, a lot of them while I was there, and I made these um, these these uh, handmade maps that were uh, I designed them to look like they were they had been dug up like a, from a from a, uh, a treasure box someplace, and I wanted the whole book to look like it was it was uh, this ancient piece of history, which it was, and um, so along with the, the stories and the culture that was passed down to me through through Famadou and Lansini. I collected all these stories and these drawings and these paintings that I had done. Um, and uh, this is a painting uh, I, I did of uh, Famadou. And um, just lots of paintings came out of this period of time uh, of the, the blacksmiths. The, the, the blacksmiths are called Numu. Um, and there was this big Numu festival to celebrate the blacksmiths because the blacksmiths are the ones who create the tools that, uh, that create the djembe and they're, they're indispensable. Um, to life there. I realized there was no notation, musical notation for this music that you could readily find. It was a couple of really obscure ethnomusicology books that had some, um, that had some Western music notation. So I wanted to, uh, to use uh, you know, a, a system of notation that was a combination of Western uh, music notation and, um, and uh, kind of like drumming notation that was, was common in West Africa. So, so I transcribed about like a dozen or so rhythms um, and uh, wrote them up into this book along with drawings and descriptions about about what the rhythms were. And so there's, like I said, there's about a dozen of these. And it was one of the first times, uh, there was really only one or two other books out there in the world at the time that had this kind of uh, written um, uh, music. And uh, I did it, of course, with, with Famadou's uh, Blessing and, uh, and Lansini's as well. And so th this is my uh, my first book, Jolie McCrossing. And um, it really just kind of scratched the surface, though, of what I had been experiencing. Um, and it was, by and large, it was like about the culture and the music and about some of my own experiences, but really what I wanted to get to the heart of was the, was the people there, uh, their stories. And so, uh, so after the book was published, uh, I went back uh, um, uh, shortly afterwards and um, decided to start working on another book. And actually, there's, there's a whole longer backstory toward, uh, uh, to this story that I won't tell you about it because is my, my third book, Finding the Source, tells the whole story in, in quite detail. 2015, I went back after being away for about two or three years, and I missed ter uh, Africa terribly. And so, uh, so Lansky and I um, met up again, and uh, we decided that we were going, going to, uh, to buy a car and uh, travel across the country back to his village, and uh, where I was going to work on another book where I was going to do uh, drawings of all the people there. And the tradition is that when anybody in the village does something that, that has any, any form of success, no matter how large or small, um, th that success is to be shared with the entire village. So um, I was really obligated, um, even though my, my first book, Jolie Crossing, was, it was, uh, is and was a really niche book that didn't find 
a huge readership. It's kind of has this small cult following by, by people who are very interested in West African music and culture, and this drumming in particular. It was like, I had never even broken even on the book, but I was still obligated to, to, um, to pay homage to the, to the people and to the culture. It was the right thing to do, right? It was this, um, this giving back, this reciprocity that is so, so important. Uh, it is, in fact, it is everything. So one of my big missions on this trip, this trip was this reciprocity of giving back to the village that I had written this book about. And so, in order to do that, we had to um, um, we had to find every single person that had appeared in this book that I had illustrated. They had about like 60 illustrations. We had to track down all of those people so that we could gather them together and I could give them each uh, a contribution. That was my token of gratitude for this book. Anyway, so uh, so I have this art studio in Kurusa that, um, that we would stay at for like three or four days at a time. I would start the sketches in the village and then we'd back, head back to Kurusa um, and uh, where I could work. From the time the sun came up, there was one little window in my in my, my little one room hut there. Uh, the sun would come streaming through at about like seven in the morning and uh, I would work like like feverishly until the sun finally went uh, by making portraits of the elders and collecting their stories and, um, and just understanding who they were. My whole, my whole task was to, to, to get their stories. This wasn't a book about me, but it was about th them, their culture, their traditions, how they saw the world. And so I was collecting their stories as I went and uh, amassing this collection of, of drawings. Uh, there's Famadou again, and, and here's a portrait of Lansini. And um, so by the end of the uh, four or five months, I had um, maybe about 30 or so of these uh, finished drawings. And the transformation that happened in me following that trip was nothing short of miraculous. Um, and uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm quite healthy today. Uh, so I don't want to give any spoilers for the book. Thank you. Um, and, and I hope you do read the book. Because during the intermission, I'd be happy to talk to you about the books and meet. we'll take a little break. I'm going to play one more piece of music for you here. The Donsu and Goni, uh, the kids in Bamako in the 1950s and, uh, and such, realized that you could play the Donsu and Goni right along to, uh, to blues music that they were hearing. And they thought this was the coolest thing. Uh, they could take this Donsu and Goni and play blues music. Well, of course, the, the older generation, the traditionalists, kind of had a fit about this and said, you can't take this sacred instrument, this sacred uh, hunter's instrument, and just, and just play rock and roll with it. And uh, the kids just really, really wanted to do it. And, um, and they said, it just works though, you know? And, and so there was a big feud between the generations and um, eventually they came up with an agreement. They said, you have to make your own instrument. Uh, you can base it around the Donso and Goni, um, but it can't be tuned exactly the same way and it, it has to sound different. So, so they invented, in the late 1950s, they invented this very instrument, the, the Kamalin Goni, which Kamale means young person, and so it's literally the young person's harp. And they realized that with this new instrument, they could start a whole new genre of music. 